Will Allen. Thank you so much for being here. The hardships of farming, you lose your knees. <laughs>
civilization. Uh, growing power is the largest year-round growing system in the state of Wisconsin. We grow food year-round and greenhouses and, and, and so forth. And we involve the entire community. I mean, not just uh, uh, a small port part of the community, but everybody, from corporate companies to uh, our politicos in our town uh, to teachers and uh, school uh, school board. We operate uh, uh, farms at schools now. Uh, we've been able to uh, be able to pass on our food in many different ways uh, to stores and restaurants. Uh, to educate kids around uh, growing healthy food and to teach teachers in a hands-on way because uh, like I was saying at the table before, when I was in college as an education major, uh, you know, one thing that they don't teach us is how to teach hands-on education. So that's something that we've been uh, doing for quite some time in Growing Power is to work with teachers, have them come in and do our workshops. We have workshops in January through June uh, two-day workshops on the weekend, and those teachers come in and they go through in a hands-on way, learn how to build these systems, learn how to compost, learn how to build aquaponic systems, learn how to do vermicompost, worm farming, so that they can take that back to the classroom and really understand uh, what that's all about, be able to pass that on to the students. And really, uh, the most important thing for us to do is to really inspire our students. And to be able to do that, we've got to do it in a hands-on way because many of our kids only learn by touching and feeling and that inspires them to want to dig deeper and uh, want, to, want to pick up a textbook and learn. So uh, that's what our work is all about. We do about 70 things around the food system. Uh, our uh, system is about research and education, but also production because we have to be able to quantify for the future for these kids. If we're going to uh, introduce these kids to uh, food systems work, we have to quantify that they can uh, make money in doing this. We have to create, uh, which I think we're going we're to be able to do, this new kind of agriculture, which is urban agriculture. More people uh, live in cities or close to cities around the world than ever before. And it doesn't make sense to be shipping food from Central Valley to Chicago and New York and around the country and food being shipped from around the world. So uh, just from an environmental standpoint, uh, it, it, it's going to be a great thing. We've been able to uh, uh, do some really extraordinary things around renewable energy, which has to be a part of this new food system that we develop. You know, I've talked to some folks here from Iowa and from Nebraska and Kansas. And most of the food that's being grown in our industrial food system is soybeans and corn and the products that make us sick. So we have to change that. I remember a couple of years ago I spoke before the um, uh, Mayor's uh, Association in, in Madison, Wisconsin, and the mayor from Des Moines, Iowa, told me in 1960, 85% of the food that was consumed in Iowa was grown in Iowa. Now it's reversed. So uh, that's the situation that we have, uh, but it's not all uh, doom and gloom because there's an excitement around local food systems. There's an excitement around urban agriculture. There's an excitement about uh, developing uh, farm systems inside cities and coastal cities. So I'm going to show you what I think is a little bit of the past, but what the future, uh, the present and the future could be in terms of developing this new kind of food system that will benefit all of us and create thousands and thousands of jobs. And as you said before, I am doing some work. I actually spoke to uh, uh, First Lady Obama yesterday. She was in uh, Wisconsin uh, to support Russ Feingold and his uh, bid to get reelected. And I had an opportunity to talk to her and they working with her on a Let's Move campaign. Uh, which uh, really has inspired many people. When they put the, uh, when she put the uh, garden in the White House uh, last year, over 10 million new people started growing food. So again, I'm talking about inspiration. And that's what you all have to do in terms of educators and folks that are working in, in this field. Is we have to inspire our students, 
keep ourselves energized and inspired. Somebody has to inspire us too. So that's part of it. And uh, I guess I get inspired by talking to kids and asking them, uh, just talking to them. And they inspire me, and that's why I, I, I do this work. Uh, and I work my 17-hour days as a farmer, because that's what I am. And why I'm always trying to learn, because I recently talked to an 80-year-old farmer, and I asked him how things were going. And he told me, he said, you know, I'm just uh, starting to learn about farm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it's all about. It's about always, it's a continuing education thing. And another thing that we have to do in this country, I've had an opportunity to, to live in Europe, playing professional basketball in Europe, Europe at the latter part of my career. Uh, and farmers are looked at differently in different countries in America. And I think we need to really put our farmers on a pedestal today, our remaining farmers. We've lost over a million since 1960. Uh, we really need to put those sustainable farmers that are growing healthy food in. Because uh, they're just as important as doctors and other folks in the profession, because they're, they're the ones that <laughs> So we have to start really looking at farmers, because farmers in every community, in these small communities and everywhere, farmers are mayors, they're uh, physicians, they're everything. You know, they don't just farm, they do other things as well. So I think we really need to realistically talk about, especially to our young people, about a profession in farming and growing food. But do it in a way that uh, is communal in nature. And this is really the work that we're doing is really about social justice. Everything that we do is wrapped around social justice because we can't have these sustainable communities and green communities that we talk about if we have a, have a lousy food system. Because food is the number one community development tool. Without a healthy, uh, why would anybody want to do anything if they're hungry? sick. And let me tell you, our, our food today is making us sick. Look at all the food steers. Look at all the chemicals that we're using in our food that's going to affect us. We don't even know the effects around them uh, on our bodies. There's research that shows it's, it's craziness. But it's research that's hidden away at universities because they're powered by the folks that, that are growing that, growing soybeans or corn. So we need to really uh, start uh, uh, thinking about our food that we eat and where we purchase our food from, how we source our food in our community, who we support in terms of uh, our food system. So I'm going to move ahead uh, here because I only got uh, 45 minutes. So. Okay, these are, this is the early years. I bought the last remaining farm in the city of Milwaukee. In 1993, uh, and this is a historic uh, farming area in the city on the northwest side of Milwaukee. It was called Greenhouse Alley, and there were a number of uh, of uh, greenhouses and uh, farms in that area back in the 20s and 30s. Uh, the farm that I own is a 19th century farm. The buildings were built in the late 1920s. This was a field that's totally uh, changed. Uh, we did a few row crops next door to us in a large army reserve base of about 300 acres. And this was, uh, you can see here, corner of the old uh, A-frame greenhouse. And these were some of the kids. Now these kids are over 30 years old. Uh, but there's something different about these kids and the kids today. As, could somebody at this table tell me what's different about these kids? Who said that? I knew it. Yeah, the pants are pulled up. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see how close the houses are. And I'm going to run through this uh, pretty quickly. Uh, this was some of our early uh, attempts at uh, composting, because composting, and I'll talk about it later, is uh, the second most important thing. And you can see the, the greenhouse in the back. Um, and lost a lot of glass. And then we uh, put poly down and we started composting, uh, uh, bigger compost system. And then we started vermicomposting, which uh, a lot of schools do, uh, were worm dens as part of the uh, learning about biology and microorganisms and so forth. And you can see the kids had their coats on, 
those greenhouses back then. And then we worked with Epper International and developed these three uh, uh, barrel fish systems. We do uh, aquaponics in uh, large uh, systems now. But this was the start of a mobile. This is something that uh, you could have in a uh, classroom. One was the um, uh, wheat tank, one was the fish tank, and one was the filter tank, and the airstone forced the water to travel through the system, replicating the Green River stream. And you could grow 50 tilapia in this uh, configuration. So we had a number of those tanks along the north wall of greenhouse number four. And we grew a lot of bedding plants back in those days because the kids would come in and uh, we'd plant bedding plants, and then they would go out and they would uh, plant those bedding plants around the city to beautify the city as a summer job. I would teach the kids how to seed. And then one of the things that we discovered from a lot of these kids back in those days is that a lot of them were being passed through uh, the school system and uh, they really couldn't read or write. So uh, one of the things that we did was uh, they would go out and do a physical activity and then we'd bring them in and we'd have them write about it. And it improved their, their uh, grades and the teachers would uh, report back to us uh, that their grades would improve and uh, kids would be more inspired and want to dig deeper and learn more. And one of the lost arts uh, was uh, preserving food that some of our grandmothers used to do. So that was one of the things that we brought back. And how to use uh, tools, you know, uh, life skill uh, training at a very uh, early age. Then more people started hearing about the work that I was doing. I was volunteering back in those days, early days. And I also worked with the juvenile justice system. Some of the kids were coming out of youth prisons back into society, and uh, they had to go through a transitional period. They were still on the ankle bracelets and so forth. And I would bring compost and put it on top of grass, and we'd grow these crops, and the kids would have to give back. And there was a way for them to give back taken so much from society, they were learning how to get back. So that was another project that we did in the early days. Then we would take uh, uh, community centers and bring in our compost and put it between the street and the sidewalks and we'd plant our bedding plants and that would give these kids summer jobs. They would be able to uh, uh, create their own summer job in the woods, taking care of those plants. And would also beautify the community and soften the community and uh, actually, crime went away in this particular community because these cars were being broken into and all of a sudden people started paying attention to the flowers and the, I guess the criminals thought they were looking at them. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so they stopped working. So. <laughs> anyway, crime uh, cool. uh, Then we would take vacant lots, same thing. These vacant lots around, we'd bring in, uh, you know, maybe a hundred yards of uh, uh, new soil, because inside our cities the soil is contaminated. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we grow so much new soil. And then one day we would transform a vacant lot into something like this. And then again the kids would take drug dealers used to hang out on those corners and all of a sudden that went away because again people started looking at the flowers and uh, the drug dealers uh, went away. Um, and then we started working with groups from outside of our community, from Southwest and uh, Upper Midwest. And then we worked in Chicago. We started working in Chicago, Inglewood uh, community. I don't know if anybody's here from Chicago, anybody from Chicago. Yeah. Well, you know, Inglewood is one of the highest crime areas of almost a murder a day back in those days. And we started putting up uh, hoop houses and started growing food. Uh, that helped the community. In 1995, our local paper wrote a front page story about me working with kids and then things really exploded in schools and nonprofit organizations started calling me and uh, that's when I got really sucked into the work that I do today. Uh, I bought this facility originally to sell my farm uh, produce for my 100 acre vegetable farm. So we started a nonprofit in 95 and it evolved into an uh, organization that now employs 50 uh, individuals and over 100 uh, students in the summertime. Uh, we have 15 farms in three uh, different areas, Chicago, uh, City of Chicago, with Madison, Wisconsin, where we're developing a farm and a community center and uh, a school. But this is the, what it looks like today, our facility. 
Um, it's powered partially by uh, solar systems, a uh, number of different solar systems. Uh, these are uh, solar panels that uh, uh, we put in last winter. Actually, uh, our staff built, we have a lot of talented carpenters, our staff built this pergola uh, in front of our building. Uh, these solar panels are now installed here. So this is what it looks like today. Our facility. We have a number of uh, vehicles that deliver food. We're we're one of the only multicultural, multi-generation, generational organizations in the country led by a person of color. Uh, so I think that has uh, helped us in terms of engaging uh, communities of color. Somebody mentioned it today about how do we uh, inspire uh, communities of color. And because we, uh, you know, I come from an area in Bethesda, Rockville, where you know even back in the '60s. Pretty multicultural. You look at Rockville today, it's a very multicultural uh, city. So uh, we really embrace multiculturalism and it's led to a lot of uh, really uh, great ideas and uh, uh, it's part of our work as we lead a movement called Growing Food and Justice of about 500 people and organizations from around the country that have an annual conference in Milwaukee to talk about uh, social justice, food justice issues, and how we dismantle racism around food in our communities. So these are some of the people that come to our facility for our training. We have over 15,000 uh, visitors a year. Thousands of our school kids come I'm very much involved with uh, working with kids and uh, providing scholarships for kids to go to school, connected with a lot of universities to give full scholarships to these kids that uh, qualify and come out of our system. But it's really about locally grown food. Because a lot of the food that we, we eat, and maybe some of the food we, we've eaten today, has lost a lot of its nutritional impact. It's being shipped from many miles away, and by the time it gets to us, it may be uh, five, six, seven, even eight, ten days old already, and uh, we're basically just eating cellulose. So that's important. Uh, and, and many of you who are farmers uh, know that uh, when you go to the backyard and you pick a tomato or you pick a ear of corn and you go eat it, it's a much different taste than when you go to the grocery store and buy it. Uh, so it's really all about food. So at all of our uh, trainings, we feed people the entire time. We just had a conference of 1,500 people. It's called uh, a National International Urban and Small Farm Conference in Milwaukee. Um, and we fed people for three days, all local food from our farmers and our co-op of farmers that we, we have within our organization. Uh, the first thing that we do, and I think it's been mentioned here, is about engaging the community. I mean, before you do any of this work, you have to really engage the community and become, uh, become accepted in the community, to be looked at as an asset to the community. If you're, if you're able to do that, then anything is possible. And then the uh, second most important thing, growing food, healthy food, is all about the soil. It's what's in the soil. Uh, and any soil scientist will tell you that, any farmer will tell you that, is that it's all about the soil, to be able to grow healthy soil. So, you know, we see this big guy rumbling through our neighborhoods, you know. And they always want us to think that they think we and they say they have over 1,700 uh, acres of wildlife habitat, but the only thing I've ever seen is, uh, you know, really seagulls and really big rats in those places. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, these trucks run on electricity, I believe. Somebody told me that. <laughs> uh, but it's really all about the soil. And what we have to do is we have to uh, be able to divert that waste that's going into the landfill. Uh, there's thousands and thousands of pounds of waste. Uh, we're up to 22 million pounds a year now in our composting facility. Uh, but we need to do that all over the country. And to be able to do that, you have to develop relationships. That's what this is all about. It's really about developing relationships with everybody. From our folks that have, and we're in a city where we have a lot of breweries. So from just one brewery, uh, Lakefront, we get 30,000 pounds of grains. Uh, wood chip from the cities. Uh, we also uh, just picked up Milwaukee uh, uh, County Zoo uh, to get their zoo do of the herbivores, zoo do, and, and, and straw. So we're doing that now. Our farm 
Farms Real Estate, where there are a lot of uh, moldy hay. We have a, a, a wet summer, we have all this moldy hay, and farmers usually burn it. Uh, they don't compost a lot of the farmers that are using chemicals. So we uh, take that along with uh, uh, vegetable waste. A lot of times there's vegetable waste that's shipped from around uh, the world uh, never gets out of these boxes. So uh, we're able to pick that up. Uh, we have one site that pick up 20,000 pounds at a time. And this uh, organic waste is what, uh, you know, creates the bacteria uh, that makes our compost with it. So this would be a typical, this is right in the city. So when you come to Growing Power, people ask me, how can you do this right here with neighbors around? It's because we've been able to engage the community and we work with the, and somebody said it earlier about working with the kids in the community to get them on board because they're going to take the message home to the parents. So we're able to break this down. Uh, with 200 feet away, we have houses and we're able to compost. We get over a million pounds right here. Uh, on our, our uh, home site. This pile is about 600 yards of compost in a static pile. And then we use that compost for many, many different things. Uh, we bank it around our uh, greenhouses, our hoop houses uh, during the winter. And then we teach folks how to do it. The smallest configuration is a 4x4 four four pallet configuration. It takes about 40 wheelbarrow loads of waste to fill it up and get the temperature up to 150 degrees, break down uh, the material, <coughs> kill the pathogens, and kill the weed seed, and so forth. So this is what we do at workshops. Then we get somebody with good legs up there and really pound it down because you want to maximize it. <laughs> so that's a job if you come to our workshops. That you can do. But this is a, a, a pallet configuration with quarter inch uh, mesh. Uh, that keeps out any vermin or whatever that's approved by many, most cities around the country. But it's really all about the soil, growing soil. That's what we do. You can grow healthy soil, you can grow healthy food, you can grow healthy food, you can grow healthy people, and then, you know, lay right up the line, grow a healthy community, and so forth. So it's really all about the soil. Now, eight months ago, this was uh, food waste, and now it's high quality uh, microbiological compost. And the kids really get it because we show them samples and they see some of the biggest amoebas and all the different microorganisms in that soil that tickle the root fibers and make the plants grow because they get a full understanding of how food grows from the ground up, not just, you know, you bring in some uh, soil you buy from uh, Home Depot or somewhere and throw it in the flat. This is, uh, they learn how to do it. And if you want to scale it up, which we really have to do, if we want to grow local food, we're going to have to grow a lot of soil. Like I said, we're at 22 million pounds in Milwaukee now. And we ship that uh, down to Chicago because Chicago has uh, a problem uh, with doing compost in the city of Chicago. So we have to move it down to Chicago. Uh, our other tool and our other employees that we have, we have millions of employees. And these are some of them. <laughs> These guys, uh, uh, in healthy soil, you should have, when you dig in your uh, backyard, you should have 30 worms per square foot. I bet you most of you won't have 30 worms per square foot. Uh, so we build these uh, vermicomposting systems, and we do this year round. And these worms break down uh, the compost. We put compost in these boxes, and they break it down. And a wonderful thing happens. They take in the bacteria at, say, 200 million count. As it travels through their body, uh, it multiplies by 14 times, and it also kills E. coli. And the only organism that really kills E. coli, the crushing E. coli in your gut. So that's why it's so important to have them in your compost. So people really like worms. And these are cocoons. Uh, up to 20 worms come out of that cocoon. Some of the varieties live over 20 years. So kids get really excited. It's so one way of getting kids hooked. We show them, they don't want to see one worm most of the time. They show them 3,000 worms in their hand. The worms jump back, and then they want to hold 2,000. See if they can hold 2,000 worms just like I do. So uh, it's a great way of getting kids really engaged uh, in worms. You can tell I kind of like worms. <laughs> and so does this guy. <laughs> She's, she's 
pounds up in the morning. Did you? <laughs> but it takes about four months uh, for the worms to eat through the compost. At that time, uh, the worm populations are multiplying four times their number. Uh, so you wind up with a lot of worms. We started with 30 pounds of worms back in 95. We have, on this one farm alone, 5,000 pounds of worms. So they, uh, again, they're working for us. They're our livestock. And they're worth a lot. We have about $275,000 worth of worms. They sell for about $35 a pound. And then we sell worm castings. Uh, highest quality organic fertilizer on earth are worm castings. So we sipped those worm castings eight months ago. That was waste, carbon and nitrogen waste. Now it's the highest quality organic fertilizer. And then we turn that into a compost tea. This works better than miracle Cure. The slow release fertilizer it increases uh, production by about 50 percent. And we do our worm uh, depositories uh, outside during the winter. Uh, we keep those piles at about 70 degrees. And once we are able to get that fertility, soil fertility, uh, then we started doing aquaponics. Again, you'll see the difference in the earlier pictures of those three barrel configurations. Now we have these systems that uh, house uh, 10,000 uh, fish, uh, 10,000 gallons of water. General rule is uh, one fish per gallon of water. And these aquaponics systems uh, are cost a fraction of what our conventional systems cost. This, these two systems would cost over $100,000 to produce 20,000 fish annually. Uh, this system costs us $5,000 to construct. So this is what we teach people. Uh, so uh, everything that we do also uh, becomes affordable for communities and schools and universities. Uh, because if they can't afford to do it, we're not going to grow this, uh, what I call the good food revolution. These are just simple recirculating uh, systems, water conservation systems. We have many visitors from around the world, so these are being installed in Africa and other countries now to grow uh, tilapia and other species of fish. Our staff is uh, putting in lake perch, which are mercury contaminated in, in uh, Lake Michigan and other Great Lakes, and there's a moratorium on commercial fishing. So this is the only way that we will be able to eat this fish. Here's our staff uh, netting fish out to be sold. Those are uh, tilapia, and those are lake perch. Tilapia, lake perch, tilapia. And we grow some koi as well. Uh, we're also uh, doing some research on black soldier fly larvae as a protein food. Black soldier fly larvae, uh, uh, they're about 42% protein. Uh, they congregate around food waste. Uh, they come from a black uh, uh, fly that looks like a small black wasp. So we've been able to cultivate some of those. There are about 200,000 in this 55 gallon drum. Uh, and we feed those to the fish. Uh, it's all about year round production. We're in a climate here in the DC area in Wisconsin, and really most of the US, where we have to grow food year round if we want local food. So this is how we do it, without fossil fuel. Uh, we're able to use our compost to heat. Uh, we mound it up around uh, uh, the greenhouses. And uh, we get about 150 degree temperature. Uh, from, and most of the cold air enters from the ground level. So if you're able to uh, protect your greenhouses that way. And then you can do this. This is all new soil. Again, the soil is contaminated in cities. We have to grow new soil. It's high nutrient. We grow uh, very intensively at about $5 a square foot, which equates to about $200,000 an acre. Average row crop farmer in this country makes about $500 an acre. So that's the difference between this new kind of agriculture. And then inside uh, these hoop houses, um, we put mounds of compost and Again, 150 degree temperature comes out of those piles at night. And we're able to cover, when it gets to 25 degrees or uh, lower, we cover at night and that keeps that heat in the, uh, in the uh, plants alive. 
And then um, to be able to grow intensively outside, that's what it's all about. Be able to have the same kind of intensive five dollars a square foot. We're, as we sit here today, we're losing our farmers, but we're also losing our agricultural land, not just here in America, but around the world. So we're going to have to grow more food for more people in the future. Um, and I'll show you how we're going to do that in the future in terms of uh, as we lose our land. But it's got to be intensive. It's got to be very intensive like this. And the only way to do that is to grow healthy soil. Every time we take crops off, we're taking uh, minerals out of the soil. We're depleting the soil, so we have to put something back instead of throwing it into a big hole in the ground. So intensive agriculture is kind of where it's at with us. Intensive greenhouse space, being able to take uh, uh, 5,000 square feet and turn it into 7,000 uh, square feet of growing space by using vertical space, not growing on one level. And we're into mushrooms. Uh, using uh, natural things that we had, not having to spend lots of money on a sterilized building to grow mushrooms. Again, using vertical space like this. And then we teach people at our workshops how to harvest these crops. Uh, some of these crops that, for example, our sprouts go, go out to Milwaukee Public Schools as an afternoon snack uh, for the students. And this is the healthiest food that these kids eat all day whether it's at home or at school or anywhere, because this gets harvested and we get it to them within a day, day and a half of production. Things like wheat grass. And then we process everything uh, on site and we package it. All these crops get packaged and go out. We have the uh, preferred salad mix, about 12 different items in our winter salad mix, edible flowers and herbs.
Um, we also have this new hot water heating system that we just finished about a month and a half ago. I work with 15 engineers uh, to design this system. It's uh, no other system like this in the world. Where we're taking uh, hot water, it's glycol that runs through those systems and get heated to 300 degrees. And these panels, uh, the hot water passes through the uh, greenhouse into a uh, heat exchanger. But before it gets there, if it's too hot, uh, then it gets blown out of the building. It gets cooled down because we only want about 200 degree temperature going into the heat exchanger. Then we pump water through our furnace uh, into the heat exchanger. It gets heated and that way it goes back into the fish systems. So this is a pretty cool system. And uh, we also work with our sewage district. We have a big problem in Milwaukee with our sewage combined system where, uh, you know, we had a seven inch rain and uh, what happens, they shut up, shut down the processing facility and it backs up into the system and then they have release points into the creeks and the creeks then take that raw sewage into Lake Michigan. And most of the days in the summer, you can't swim in Lake Michigan anymore. So, um, they have this grant program and I designed a system to collect all the water off of our A-frame greenhouses. Uh, and we use this water to grow fish. We also use this water to water our plants. And we use this water to pump it back into the greenhouse into a fish system inside. So we're moving water year round from outside in uh, to the uh, greenhouses. All these systems are affordable, and they have multiple uses. Uh, as a matter of fact, all of our uh, fish systems actually heat our poop houses and our greenhouses. And we also have animals, because in our school district, our kids aren't allowed, uh, they don't have financing to take the kids out to the farms anymore. So what teachers do is they put the kids on the city bus, and we have a bus stop right outside of our facility, and they come and see all these animals. So they get their real farm experience of seeing uh, uh, farm animals and taking them <coughs> over, uh, understanding and participating in programs that we have with schools. Some of the schools do their science-based hands-on learning in our facility. Uh, we have 700 layers, chickens that lay eggs, and ducks and turkeys. We're breeding heirloom turkeys as well. So the kids get a really, and we do bees. Uh, we have 19 hives that produce uh, about 150 pounds of honey per hive, which is much better than in rural communities because of the kind of agriculture we do now. We don't have any weeds or any pollen for the bees to, uh, to gather. <clears throat> and we teach beekeeping to our youth as well as uh, folks from around the world that come there for the trainings. And we market our urban honey. Uh, and it's delicious. It's uh, white clover honey. Uh, this is the city of Chicago. I like this image because it really shows that you, you can grow food uh, in downtown Chicago. Imagine that. And these are some of our projects. Uh, one of the things I like to work with is the disabled. We're working with the Milwaukee, uh, 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 the Milwaukee organization that uh, works with thousands of disabled folks in this young lady. Line. Uh, I was teaching her how to grow sprouts and how to seed the trees, and after about a half hour, she was able to do it as well as I could. Yeah. And we also work with Catholic charities and uh, seniors, uh, immigrant seniors, wanted to have a garden. So what we did is we brought our wood chip and our compost and on top of asphalt. Uh, we grow on top of asphalt, concrete, any surface to create a garden. And. Uh, we had a dedication, and then Coles Corporation, one of the most successful corporations, they have 4,000 employees down the street. They now have gardens on their corporate campus growing food. Their associates uh, volunteer growing power. They also have a foundation um, that uh, uh, supplies uh, funding for our organization. Uh, city of Milwaukee became the fourth city in the nation to have a garden uh, at City Hall. And we put that in, and now, uh, we're growing food in downtown Milwaukee. So people really get that experience that you can grow food in the city um, and you can grow it without uh, uh, the usual problems that we used to have in terms of dealing with 
uh, contamination rock well automation. We have a farm stand, Discovery World, a museum on the lakefront. We have our aquaponics system. Um, there, we're also uh, operating a, a greenhouse and a cemetery. All the cemeteries used to have uh, greenhouses where they grew the flowers to go in the graves. So they had this historic greenhouse and the most historic uh, cemetery in Milwaukee where all the leaders. Uh, so I told the news media and the director of this, now we're growing food to keep people out of that upper quarter. A little bit lower than that. Uh, they need that help in food. But, uh, again, uh, when we're doing urban agriculture, we want to do it in places anywhere. Everywhere is uh, nothing's off limits. So this is the old cemetery greenhouse. It's Washington Park. The mayor on the left there, uh, all the one on the right. We put in 40 gardens in these boxes uh, that were supplied by uh, uh, Home Depot or one of those organizations. And we're opening a 2,200 square foot uh, store. The dedication was yesterday uh, on King Drive in Milwaukee. And uh, this is our new composting facility at Metropolitan Milwaukee Sewage District. A uh, four acre facility will do our 22 million pounds there this year. And across the street, we have a 30-acre farm uh, right on the lakefront where we're building, uh, we build these houses from scratch and straight pipe, and then we seed them down with uh, very intensively. We're also growing, uh, working with the high school to build a, a green uh, uh, garage off the grid. Uh, two classes will do this training. Uh, it'll be operational. In Madison, Wisconsin, working with the Center for Resilient Cities, uh, we're building a community center, uh, gardens, uh, it'll be a charter school, uh, agricultural charter school. Uh, the, the school district in uh, Madison has already approved this. Uh, we bought this uh, land uh, from uh, uh, Dane County, which is a county that Madison's in. We also work with the Boys and Girls Club. If you have this compost, you can grow food anywhere. This is in a park next to the uh, Boys and Girls Club, and now these kids. And we also signed a 20-year lease for a five-acre piece of land at Maple Tree School, an operational uh, uh, K through uh, sixth grade school. And now every class in the school has a uh, garden. Uh, un unbelievable that every class in that school is actually a garden. And we had a big dedication with the mayor and school board. And about four weeks later, the kids in the community, very challenging community, mostly absentee landlord uh, driven. And these kids and uh, parents are leaning food. And working with these kids, uh, that's what it's all about, passing on this next group of kids. And right now, when I first started this work, I'd say 60% of the people were academics and and uh, I would say over 60 now, uh, population has changed in the last few years. 40% of the people are under 40 years, 60% of the people are under 40 years of age that are involved in urban agriculture. So that's a big change and it gives me a lot of hope for the future in terms of growing this revolution. And this is Grant Park, historic Grant Park, two acre farm, very aesthetically pleasing in downtown Chicago. 20,000 people or more go by this every day. During Taste of Chicago, over 100,000 go by. Uh, so, this has been uh, something that's influenced a lot of folks. It's called Art on the Farm. So, we're combining art uh, with, uh, with agriculture. Uh, 159 different uh, varieties of vegetables, and edible flowers, and herbs uh, grown in a protege design. Uh, and Cabrini Green, the most famous uh, housing product, project in America, or infamous. Um, we're growing food on top of asphalt, 100,000 pounds of compost, and uh, working with the Fourth Presbyterian Church, and uh, somebody had mentioned uh, about working with churches. This is one church that really gets it in terms of having a concrete project that they can involve their 4,000 parishioners. And so it's a very successful project. We're in our seventh year of working with them and having youth programs around uh, this project. And this is when you really get kids uh, wanting to be a part of this. And kids from uh, that uh, green, green uh, community on the south side of Chicago, uh, Jackson Park, another garden, 
dedication last year. And this was our first project in downtown Chicago. Uh, with these students, this was also an art project uh, that these young people had never guarded before, but uh, bringing in compost and at the schools in Chicago. We bring in our compost and the schools can grow on top of asphalt in the backyards of seniors uh, involved. And this past year, we were at the Chicago uh, Flower and Garden Show uh, to display what we do. And a lot of these kids would uh, not be doing this. They would probably be doing something not so good in their community, but getting them involved, because most of those teams, you know, another thing that we've learned in our work is that, you know, these uh, um, six to 14 year olds, yeah, they want to do it. But to really engage those teens, those 17 to 24 year olds, uh, we have to plan to get them involved. They're not just going to go out there and say, I'm going to start farming. So that's one of the things, and uh, believe me, it's a big savings that we're able to come up with funding uh, to be able to pay those teams to, to have summer jobs. And our crime uh, definitely decreases uh, a lot if we're able to pay those teams. Because all they're looking for is to have some money in their pocket. They're going to get money one way or the other. And then our market baskets we distributed and our outreach work around the country, working with different organizations and around the world now, uh, working in Africa and uh, we'll be working in Haiti, working with uh, native communities, uh, being invited into those communities to be able to work. Uh, it's been a big, uh, a big step forward for us. In Mississippi, many people are starting to go back to Mississippi and start small farms. So we help them uh, uh, in terms of uh, our outreach training centers around the U.S. We have 12 of them now and a lot more uh, on, on the way. Arkansas, New Orleans, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, another one of our training centers. Lynchburg, Virginia. Whole greenhouse operation that's now growing vegetables and doing composting, working with kids, young people's project in Jackson, Mississippi. These kids built their own hoop house. Uh, Buffalo, New York, another Rust Belt uh, city using stimulus dollars. Uh, they were in Minnesota working with the uh, Women's Environmental Institute, another one of our um, training centers. Uh, we'll be going there doing uh, training in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Kenya. Uh, they have fertility problems. This is a landfill in Kenya. It's a rudimentary fence. So we're doing work in Kenya and Ghana and soon to work in Haiti. But uh, these food issues are not just in this country, but they're around the world. Uh, when I spoke to uh, uh, Secretary of State Clinton, she said the next wars will not be over uh, things that we think. They're going to be over food and water. Because everybody blames us. They don't blame anybody else but the U.S., she said. Uh, we lose five million people because of bad water and food around the world, so we have to fix that. We're getting blamed for that. This is another farm that I'm developing, just taking an old building. This will be aquaponics inside this building. And fish processing facility because we don't have one in the Milwaukee area. It's an old laundry building, a very tough neighbor. Monopoly Valley, 60-acre farm. We'll go on top of this asphalt. Another one of our future projects. Iron Street in Chicago. Uh, we're taking this uh, truck terminal. It's going to look like this. This is our Chicago, where our Chicago office will be. And this is uh, our new building, uh, the first of its kind in the nation, a vertical five-story building that will house uh, plants and our staff and a multi-use building with a commercial teaching kitchen for young people to try to inspire them to become chefs. And that will be going up. So if there's anybody in this uh, uh, crowd that's going to contribute, uh, can give me a check for $10 million. <laughs> <laughs> Put your name on every window and door. <laughs> Thank you very much.
amazing what you're doing in urban areas and it's an inspiration to all of us. And I have two questions. Actually, the first one is kind of quick. You at the beginning said uh, composting is the second most important. Which is the first? Engaging the community. Okay. So my second question is the big one. And in Puerto Rico, we're uniting with, uh, we're collaborating with five other states to submit for the People's Garden pilot project of USDA. And we're very excited about it. And one of the big things is, and the big question is, after, let's say hopefully we'll get funded, and what do we do after that? How do we actually maintain this and become something that doesn't depend on external funding, but the community and the government and the schools, we can just continue to do it? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons we're quantifying all these different things that you saw in terms of aquaponics and, the, and the, over 50% of our income comes from our own efforts of selling products and services. So uh, that's how we do it. Uh, you can't be, if you're going to sustain these projects, you have to come up with an income generating, uh, uh, you know, selling products and services, I would say, uh, would be one way of doing it. So, uh, you know, we have our training that starts in January through June sessions each month, so you might want to uh, come to one of those and really learn how to do this, because there, there are some skills you have to develop to do this uh, uh, urban agriculture. It's a little bit different than our grand, grandfather's kind of farming, so it's really important to learn uh, some of the uh, skills that you need. The good news is we can do two more questions because we have to change this computer out. Oh, okay. So we'll work you a little harder. So if we can take a couple more questions. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask if you ever used your um, solar water heat as root zone heating. And if you don't, why not? Uh, what was that? Root. root zone heating in your greenhouses? Uh, not yet. Uh, what we do is we heat the water uh, in those. Uh, we don't use uh, very much forced air. Forced air heating would just go right out of those old greenhouses. So we have this thermal mass of hot water. Uh, where did that question go? Oh. <laughs> uh, we use that thermal mass of, uh, you know, in the one uh, greenhouse, we have 20,000 gallons of hot water, 85 degrees. Uh, there's a lot here, and, and that is like geothermal in a sense. That, that keeps, that's more effective than having forced air. So we, we've been able to save 50 percent, cut 50 percent of our energy costs by heating that water. At the same time, you're raising fish. So uh, you know, every 10,000 tilapia, we're making about $60,000 in an annual year. Uh, so. Uh, we're trying to get multiple uses out of it. When I design stuff, I try to get multiple uses out of it. In a very simplistic way, very low co cost way. Those systems, 10,000 gallon system and a commercial system, with uh, infrastructure would cost over $100,000. So that cost us about $5,000 to install that system. Yes? Why are you putting so much top of concrete rather than Well, the cost is just prohibited them, you know. And plus, when you remove the concrete, you got contamination a lot of times underneath that uh, asphalt concrete. So uh, food grows very well if you're able to put two feet or beds of 36 inches wide, two feet of compost, uh, that's enough root zone to grow corn or anything. Uh, and, and you're not dealing with contamination. The other thing about growing your own soil is you don't have any weeds. You're killing your weed seed. So uh, you get very minimal, you get practically no weeds the first year. You get a little bit the second year because you're getting some weed seed that may travel through the air or it may come in your seed or whatever. Uh, but that's one of the things that's kept a lot of people away from farming is having the whole weeds and full weeds. I'm sure a lot of you have done that. <laughs> one more question. Yeah. Yes, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on any projects you've been involved in in really arid environments and how you, if you've been able to overcome the challenges of the irrigation. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that we do those aquaponic systems. Those are recirculating the same waters, recirculating the plants are pulling out. Uh, when the fish give out their waste, it's ammonia and it changes to nitrate and nitrate. You have to get that out of the water. So we grow uh, watercress. Uh, 
when we're growing lake perch, because the water has to be really pristine. Uh, but we also use tomatoes and any other crops in the tilapia, because tilapia are cichlids, and they take in algae as a food source, and they're always taking in. But those systems are designed as water conservation systems. So that's why a lot of African visitors, and, and while we're using those systems in Africa, where they have obvious water issues. That's one way of doing it. Question, uh, to what extent have schools adjusted their curriculum to tie into what you're doing? And uh, as a corollary, uh, have you impacted career plans for students and uh, tried to organize what you're doing to open up careers for young people? Yeah. Uh yeah, both of those things. We're uh, working with, uh, we're actually writing curriculum. We got funded by Chase uh, uh, Chase Bank uh, to develop the curriculum. We're actually, it's Jeremy here. Jeremy, you want to stand up from Stevens Point, uh, University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. Uh, uh, they've done some curriculum around energy, uh, some really uh, cutting edge uh, curriculum uh, that ties in with the uh, uh, Public, uh, the public school standards, the state standards, uh, but I think they've gone away from those standards now, so it makes it a lot easier for us to develop our own curriculum, uh, you know, and we're able to pass that on to the schools. I'm actually developing a, a, a toolkit that will be going out to schools all over the country on how to grow those sprouts. Uh, everything will come in a box. It won't be a 200-page uh, curriculum that teachers, because teachers don't have time for that. Uh, they need some simple instructions of how it works and so forth, and that's going to go out, and that's being funded by Chase Bank. Uh, you know, because a lot of the teachers, you know, there's a lot of really gung-ho teachers that will do anything, but there are a lot of teachers that you know, have to be brought in along a continuum to really buy into this. So we're creating these uh, tools.